Let's talk about consumers and more specifically delinquencies. I really want to bucket this kind of into three buckets. There's credit card delinquencies, there's auto loan delinquencies, and then there is housing delinquencies. Because I think there is a story going on that most people miss. In order to have this conversation, we do it with Taylor from Life Goal Investments. Man, how you doing? I'm doing great. This is an interesting one because this is where statistics can be spun to tell one side of the story or the other side of the story. If you zoom in right now on delinquencies, it looks like a shelf going upwards like this or a yeah. slope going upwards meaningfully. And you're like, oh my Lord, we are in for a hell of a storm here. And then yeah. if you zoom out, you look at it and we're basically right in line with historic averages. So it's, it's how do you want to look at this and how do you perceive data? Because how you interpret this could tell two massively different stories. Yeah. So let's start with credit cards. I think there's a couple of things the average person is being told. One, we have over a trillion dollars in credit card um, balances, right? Which yep. is a record. Yep. We also have seen some numbers about rate of change uh, being significant. Again, your your total zoom in, right? Let's let's create yep. the scariest story possible. Yep. And I guess lastly, credit card rates, damn, are over 20%. So 25-ish. Yep. Oh, crazy. Crazy. So when you look at the credit cards, um, you know, balances, delinquencies, what do you think that means? Do you think it means that that you know the average consumer is out of cash and they're just running amok? Or do you think there might be a different story out there? What do you, what do you think about credit cards? I the, the one trillion dollar number doesn't scare me. And I sound like an idiot saying that, right? One trillion dollars in credit card debt doesn't scare you. It doesn't. When you zoom out and you look at it relative to overall economic output, it's right where it should be. It's right where historic norms are on a percentage basis. So the one trillion does not scare me. What scares me to the point that you just made is the rate of change. So we came from extraordinarily suppressed levels of credit card delinquencies because everyone got a $1,200 check and then they got another one, right? And so that was just stimulus money. So what they did with that, good for them, is pay down their credit card debt. And therefore we went to historic lows on credit card delinquency. But what you've seen is a meaningful pickup from that point. Now the meaningful pickup has only gotten us in line with historic norms, but the direction is, is, is not necessarily comforting. And you look at this and, and the surprising thing from an economic standpoint is you look at it and say, normally credit card debts don't spike during a time with extremely, extremely low unemployment. But yeah. that's exactly what we're seeing. Yeah, I think what's going on with credit cards, uh, there's so much in the economy that is going to be really turn out to be just regression to the mean. I think we had artificially low balances and low delinquencies, which also probably means credit card companies were under-reporting and kind of working with people. Yep. And I just think all of that's being cleaned up. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, all these folks are just, you know, doing their job, frankly. Uh, Discover specifically came out with some really bad numbers and, and had to increase loan loss reserves, I think, last week. Yep. And but to your point, when you zoom out, we're we're kind of right in line with historical averages. And if I'm right, what does that mean? It means we're going higher. Yep. Right. Yep. That's what regression in the mean uh, kind of indicates. So I think we're going to go higher. I, too, don't think it's some kind of earth shattering thing. I think there's a lot of consumers who, frankly, don't know how to spend, don't know how to save. We'll get in trouble. We'll go back to the credit card companies. We'll do a loan workout. And it's just it happens all the time. It's just that we're coming off a low base. So this, you know, that shelf that, you know, the whatever reverse cliff, it just looks shocking if you zoom in. Yeah, totally agree. And this coming from a financial advisor who profits from people investing money with us. If you have credit card debt, don't invest. Don't <laughs> invest. It's a 20%, 25% return. Pay that shit off. Correct. Pay that down as quickly as possible. But here's the reality of what comes with that. When you think about opportunity cost. Okay. People can pay down credit card debt or they can invest in the market, right? Obviously everyone would rather have their money invested in the market because that takes stock prices higher. But if all of a sudden they're looking at this and saying, Hey, I'm actually going to sell some of my stock exposure to pay credit card debt on the other side. What does that do to the market at large? Yeah. Well, let's flip over to cars. Yep. Because I think there's a real story in auto, auto loans. Uh, and I think it's the exact opposite of housing. We'll get to housing after autos. Yep. 
I, if you were paying attention in the auto market the last couple of years, prices for product went up, used cars went up. And I mean, there were, I don't know, TikToks and, you know, stories and all this of people with thousand dollar car payments. The only reason, in my opinion, that those were approved was because people weren't spending on other shit. Now that all these things have kicked in and life has smacked you in the face, and I say this as an idiot who bought a $40,000 car when he made 25 grand. So I get it. I've been that stupid before as well. And um, I just think they're looking at their car going, you know what? Too hard. Can't pay it. Got to do other things. I think the car is going to be the thing that goes. Uh, take it. They'll just take it. Take, take it. it. I'm not I'm not letting the roof over my head go. My it's family's exactly got to have a place going. to live. We got to eat. We're not going to let those two things go. Therefore, take it. And right? there's optionality I, I, today. Yeah. That's it. That's it. It's opportunity cost. What what can I afford and what can I afford to do without? And a car, yeah. unfortunately, might be that. The reality is the numbers were shocking. Shocking, shocking. are shocking. Right now, the average new car in the United States, and this is going to be within a couple hundred dollars of the exact right number, is $48,800. The average household income Average household income, this is not individual income, household income is about $72,000. What? How do those numbers equate? So that makes the average car payment somewhere in like that 780 range. Yeah. Right? That is the entirety of your household income basically going to a car payment. That's not reality. And a lot of this is a function of the owner, you know, the, the owner's supply chains that we saw happen via COVID, semiconductors. If you look at EVs, EVs use an exorbitant, exorbitant, exorbitant amount of semiconductors. And when they're not there for purchase, being the semiconductors, those EVs can't be constructed. And therefore, there is a supply constraint on that. And that forces prices higher. And that happened around not just EVs, which are the biggest proponent, but also cars in general right now. Lane shift and things like that, where they lane assist you, that's all chips. And so if they can't get their hands on the chips, that creates a real issue. Yeah. And the other thing I saw was really interesting. Um, you know, Tesla cars in the used car market for the longest time, you'd almost get a premium for Teslas. Yeah. They've been buy it, sell it later at a higher price. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> wild, right? Uh, that is not the case anymore. The Tesla specifically, and I think this is true for all of these, all EVs have seen a noticeable down, downdraft in resale values. Yeah. And- you want to know why? I just talked about this in the last episode. Tesla is now has inventory on their website. Yeah. You go on their website and say, I'll buy a brand new one for $48,000, not the used one for forty seven nine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think what we're seeing in with, and also let's talk about cars. A lot of people bought that third toy, right? Yep. And to your point, I think what we're seeing with auto loans when, when, because I say this as a kid who was probably 12, 13, 14 at the time, watching his mother at a kitchen table, try to juggle delinquent bills because it was 80 sucked. Yep. And, um, you know, at the time, you know, the most important thing to my mom was the house. It wasn't the car. We didn't have cell phones then, but it wouldn't have been the cell phone. It would, it just, it wouldn't have been these other things. They, she would have cut cable. She would have cut, you know, everything. Yep. Um, you know, so to, to fight and stay in the house. And I think that's going to shock a lot of the crash bros and doomers, uh, because if we roll into housing, uh, we have Can seen have- again, Go ahead. Can I cut you off one second? Because I want to yeah. talk just about one more thing on Tesla. The Please. other thing that's important with Tesla and EVs in general right now is that we don't know how far forward this tax credit that you get oh, yeah. when you purchase a new EV is going to last. So right now you get a $7,500 tax credit. That's like getting a $7,500 reduction on the price. Yep. And we don't know if that's going to proceed into 2024 and forward. So that'll be mm-hmm. another interesting thing to say, okay, if I can buy that $48,000 car, which is kind of where the Tesla ballpark is. And I can take a seven and a half, you know, $7,500 tax rebate on that. And all of a sudden I'm at a $40,000 car. That's stomachable. But if that's yeah. not there anymore, boom, that directly inflates the price of that car. So, so I didn't mean to circle back. No, Continue on your, your housing. But I, I think that's something that's important that the market has to realize. And I, and I think, <laughs> I keep saying proceed, but let me say something first. <laughs> um, I think what's interesting there is you could get a, run demand wise from now until the end of the year on EVs, potentially you could get people running out and saying, I'm going to purchase this now because I want that $7,500 tax credit. And I don't know if it's going to come next year. And that'll be interesting to see how that plays out in earnings, et cetera. And how many cars are moved on the EV market between now and year end. Yeah. 
I actually thought I read something, but I, I I don't know for certain. I read so many articles. I thought there was talk about making the seventy five hundred dollar credit actually easier in twenty twenty four, but I may have read that. There's I, just I a it. lot of outstanding question marks in general. It's not clear as to not where done yet. Going okay. Forward. Yeah. There you go. Well, let's get to housing delinquencies because again, I think based on who you talk to, uh, delinquencies again thirty day delinquencies are up noticeably. 90 day delinquencies are down a tick. And again, if you don't know housing, 90 days is where you're considered seriously delinquent. That's that's when a foreclosure could start. 90 days, no yep. sooner. Yep. Um, so that's significant. 30 days are up, 90 days down. Um I just think with a blended interest rate of 3.6%, yes, I know rates are eight percent today, but most people bought their homes you know, months, years ago when the rates were yep. lower. Yep. Families are going to sit around the virtual kitchen table, if not a kitchen table, and make hard choices. And this is if a recession happens. If a recession doesn't happen, then you know this this doesn't play. But if we do have a recession and there's job losses and families are like mine, who my dad was unemployed, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, and you got to juggle and make tough choices. Unlike the Great Recession, this is exactly opposite of the Great Recession. And, and I know a lot of young people don't have another frame of reference, so let me give it to you. The house and specifically the mortgage is an asset today. Correct. Correct. Your Correct. your mortgage payment is less than rent by a mile yep. for some of these people. And for some people, the payments are so low. If you have a 2.8, 2.9, 3.1, you can pay it with unemployment. If you're looking at your, your household kind of outside in, right? You got your three cars and you got your house. Guess which goes first? It's the cars, absolutely, not the house, absolutely, and 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 they should go first because it's not an absolute necessity. And not even looking at that, but thinking about the underlying interest rate on the cars is significantly higher than that of the house as well. So just making financial, you know, decisions on interest rates, which are important, that leads you to the same conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think, and the other thing that's going on is its values are falling, and this is going to be very much like the Great Recession. Why did the Great Recession for real estate get so bad? Is that the debt reset, which meant mortgage payment greatly exceeded rent. So you're, you move and you, your, your situation improves, but also the asset value, you were underwater and people didn't want to pay up. A lot yep. of these cars you all bought are way underwater. Yep. There's no yep. value there. So take the loss, get it repoed, go get a, you know, a secondhand car somewhere else for, you know, five grand. You're still mobile. Yep. Um, you can still so get to work. Be a, yeah, it's it's a very different story. And I I just think a lot of people have a recency bias or were so young that that's their only experience that housing crashes um you know can happen this way and it's just it's not set up. Delinquencies are going to spike in autos and credit cards a lot more than housing in my opinion. Yeah, and and to be honest with you from a first-hand perspective, you just given me a little bit of education because I I can look at the numbers and look at data but like when you speak about it concisely how you've actually experienced some of this stuff and the decisions that your family went through are like, okay, that's eye opening. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't seem like you can make another decision. There's no other decision to be made. Yeah. There. Well, you're going to, you got to keep the Mercedes or BMW paying a thousand bucks a month plus insurance and let your house go. So you can take your BMW and go live with mom and dad. Cause think about the choice of down selecting. You don't want to live in your car. Most people. Do you want to move in with family? Not most people. Do you want to down select from a house to an apartment? Not most people. I mean, nope. these are the choices people have. And oh, by the way, if the mortgage is an asset, you can ask your sister or your cousin yep. to go rent a spare bedroom, you yep. know, for a year as you get back yep. on your feet. Yep. And um, not to mention culturally, culturally, it, yeah. this is a, we own houses culture. That's, that's the way it works. That's not the case everywhere, right? That's not the case in Europe per se, but we want to be homeowners as Americans. And that's yeah. something that, that people do not want to let go of. You got it. Well, you do an amazing job of educating people daily. I don't know how you find the time to do it, but you are amazing at it. Where can people find you? I appreciate that, Michael. Yeah, find us on uh, on Instagram and on TikTok at Life Goal Investments. Again, just a daily second, 60 seconds on whatever's going on in the market and the economy. You got it, buddy. Thanks again.